we continue in the sermon series, uh, and so I want to get your Bibles out right now and turn to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Today I want to talk to you about this all-important topic that, that that's, it's, it's all about prayer. Prayer is, is just paramount to a Christian's life. This morning I want to talk to anybody who's ever dissatisfied with their prayer life. I want to talk to that person if you ever feel guilty about not praying enough or you even feel confused that prayer even, you know, makes a difference or even works at all. Let me be really clear who, I, who I'm not talking to. If prayer comes easily to you, if, you know, you, you, your mind never wanders when you start to pray, if you're, you never get troubled by unanswered prayer. If somebody cuts you off on the street when you're driving and your first thought is to just pray a prayer of blessing in their life. Okay? If you win the lottery and your first response is to pray, God, thank you. Forgive me for playing the lottery, but thank you and, and help me to tithe my winnings to the church. If you are a Jedi warrior of prayer, I am not talking to you. I am talking to the rest of us who have this problem with our prayer life. Here's the thing about, about us. We all pray. Whether we think we do or not, we all pray. It's a part of who we are as human beings. It's just knitted into our DNA that we pray. You know, in moments of great joy, in moments of great need, in moments of great sorrow, in moments of great fear, in moments of guilt, we will pray to somebody or something bigger than ourselves. It's just who we are as human beings. And we wonder why, is this so complicated? Or am I, am I, doing, this, am I doing this prayer thing right? Am I following the rules. So in the middle of the greatest talk ever given in the history of mankind and Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, he gives the most incredible prayer ever prayed in the history of the world. And he gives a couple warnings to us about it. And so we're in chapter 6, starting in verse 5. Jesus says this, And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. I don't know about you, but every now and then I'll get in a group of people and we'll start to be praying and somebody will be praying out loud and we'll start taking turns to pray. You ever been in that kind of situation? I'm going to be totally honest with you. Sometimes I have these thoughts in my mind. Instead of thinking, okay, what is it that this person is praying about and actually praying and joining in with them? I'm thinking about what I'm going to say when it comes to be my turn to pray out loud. Am I the only one? I have these thoughts. Well, I hope that what I say is really, you know, spiritual sounding. I hope that, that it'll actually make sense to people. I, I don't want to sound stupid. I don't want to sound unspiritual or foolish. I don't want to be thinking those kinds of thoughts, do I? I want to be joining with that person who's praying and really getting enveloped in what they're saying and joining them with that. But I have these thoughts. And so Jesus gives us uh, these words, this strategy in verse 6. He says, but when you pray, go into your room, close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. And then your father who sees what's done in secret will reward you. Now, in Jesus day, they, you know, in these poor homes in Palestine, they didn't have a lot of, of places to do that. You'd go into their place in their house. They wouldn't have like. Uh, these, you know, these bedrooms that you could just go into where you could just have total privacy. Really, the only place that had a door that you could close and even lock was the storage room where you kept your food and where you kept some of the tools. It was a really unimportant area of the house, and that was the place. 
There's one good reason that I can think of that's, that's, that makes sense to pray in private, and it's this. If you're not good at it, only God can hear you. The good thing is, if you pray from your heart, God doesn't matter. He, I mean, God doesn't care. He loves it when we pray from straight from our heart. Beyond that, Jesus is addressing here a huge issue that most of us come across when we start to pray in our prayer life. God is unseen. And this God who is unseen, he sees what is done in secret. Prayer is based on the reality of things that we don't see. But we've been conditioned in our culture. We've been conditioned in our day. Everywhere we look, we only believe in what we see here, you know, whatever we touch. And it's a problem. The most important part of you, my friend, is the unseen. Every one of you have come here because you had an intention in your mind to be here today. Raise your hand if you've ever seen an intention. Your thoughts, your dreams, your aspirations, all those things are unseen. And our bodies respond to those things that are unseen. In fact, everything that you can see began as an idea, and it's something that's totally invisible. And Jesus says, that's true not only of us, it's true of everything else on the planet. Reality that we can actually see and feel and touch the things in the physical form are actually undergirded and braced up by everything that is unseen, everything that is invisible. And that especially includes our God who is unseen and his great kingdom. So prayer is hard for us because we think that, that we're not actually moving ahead. We're, we're not actually achieving something, and that becomes a problem for us. We feel like we're at a standstill. So many of you know that Jennifer and I have golden retrievers. Gunther, my favorite, is actually our male golden retriever. And back when he was just a few weeks old, this little guy just loved to do pretty much anything. He loved to run around, he loved to play with toys, and he loved to play tag and and, and jump and all this stuff. But he really hated riding in the car. Now, when Gunther was really little, he had some health issues, and we were kind of worried about that, so we didn't leave Gunther alone very often. Sometimes I had to drive him to work with me. He didn't like riding in cars very much. And so I would put Gunther on my lap, put my seatbelt on. It's hard to put a seatbelt on a little puppy. So I just kind of held him in my lap. And he was fine if we were moving. But as soon as we stopped, as soon as I had to stop at a stoplight, his eyes would get really big and he would start to freak out. He would start to whimper and whine. He would start to cry and bark. He was like, I don't want to stop. I don't like this stopping thing. I want to keep going. Let's get where we're going. And it's like, even at a very early age, just a couple weeks old, he's like, I I can't stand to stop. I want to move forward and get there. For a lot of us, prayer is like stopping at a stoplight. We feel like we're at a standstill and nothing is really happening. Sometimes you pray and you don't get what you want and it feels like you're at a standstill, like you're at a stoplight. And this is a problem. Jesus knew all about us. And he goes on and he says, don't keep on babbling like pagans for they think they'll be heard because of their many words. If we're honest, sometimes we see people and they think that prayer is this whole like, well, it's this thing that we have to do. It's kind of a a superstitious kind of a thing. It's a superstition. There's an old cartoon, Charlie Brown cartoon, where Linus is actually talking to Charlie Brown. And he says, I have just made an important theological discovery. I have found that if you pray with your hands going upside down, you'll actually get the opposite of what you're praying for. And you're probably thinking, well, maybe that's what I'm doing wrong. (laughs) Sometimes people think that prayer is mindless, that it's just kind of this mindless mumbo jumbo. And we just kind of let our, our minds just go on autopilot and it just goes wherever we want it to go. I've heard pastors in churches say some of the stupidest things in their prayers. 
You know, I'll hear pastors say stuff like, God bless us as we come into your presence this morning. And I imagine God's just rolling his eyes out of his head when he is actually, the Bible says that he is a God who, who transcends all space, who transcends all time. And he's like, where have I ever been? I've been here the whole time. I'm always in your presence. Or sometimes we'll go and we'll, we'll decide to kind of break our diet and we will go to some fast food restaurant and we'll just buy all this really greasy, grimy food that's just full of butter and sugar and fat and cholesterol and we'll pray, dear God, bless this food to the nourishment of our bodies. It doesn't make any sense. I mean, you might as well just say, God, please bless me as I have a heart attack in five minutes. That's basically what's going to happen. Prayer in the Bible was actually, get this, prayer in the Bible was actually very intelligent, thought out, thoughtful conversation with God. And it was all about our relationship with God and where we are in life with God. That was prayer in the Bible. And the reason why the mind matters so much is that through your mind, you can actually make contact with reality, not just in the physical world, but especially in the spiritual world where God and his kingdom are just as real, but very invisible. So Jesus gives us these warnings and then he, he gives us probably one of his best gifts. It's this prayer of all prayers. It's the, it's the prayer that has been, you know, it's been repeated more than any other prayer in human history. And, and he gets to the point of what we need to do when we pray. It's like getting advice from Jesus on how to pray is like getting advice from Michael Phelps on how to swim. I mean, who wouldn't want that? So I want to give you a little homework this week, my friends. I want each one of us to go through and I want you to, to get to this part of scripture in Matthew chapter 6. And I want you to read through the Lord's Prayer once every day for seven days. And I don't want it to be something that you just check off and do. Be intentional about this. Do this with a little bit of time. Let the thoughts and, and, and the, the, the emotions that Jesus is actually saying when he's praying this prayer, let them permeate your mind and your body. Let what is going in your heart and in your mind, in your life, let your desires come up as you start praying this prayer and see that it won't change your life. I want you to do this once a day for seven days. Now, I've told people who don't really get in the practice of praying in the morning every day, hey, take your toothbrush, put it under your bed, and it'll remind you to get on your knees in the morning and pray. If you have golden retriever puppies, you might want to brush that off a little bit, but do it. It'll be a good way to remember. Now, the idea of this prayer is not just to rush through again. It's not just to rush through, but to actually spend some time on each of these different verses looking at what he was saying and how it can pertain to your life today. What I want to do with the rest of this talk is I want to talk through each of these phrases in the best prayer ever prayed in the history of the world. And I want to start with our Father in heaven. Now, this reminds us, our Father in heaven, this phrase, it reminds us this, this is a prayer not just of, of just something that we're doing that we do a lot, and that's worrying. Praying is not like worrying out loud. Praying is so much different. Praying is actually thinking through in conversation with the Almighty God. And when we do this, it's really important to actually connect with who we're praying to. It's important to say the Lord's name. It's important to address God. You know, anytime that I talk to somebody, anytime that I email somebody, I don't just say, hey, you. You know, I, I say, hey, Jennifer, hey, Michael, hey, Nick. We say, hey, Father. Jesus tells us to address the almighty God, the almighty creator and judge of all things as Father. If you think about it, the entire gospel is actually wrapped around this one little word, our. 
not my, not yours. It's beautiful. It's, it's our. It's very inclusive. He is a God of gods. He is the God of everyone that you ever meet in the world. He is your God, and he is your God, and he is mine. Here's the thing. Whatever your earthly dad was like, whatever your earthly dad did, You always have a heavenly father who made you and loves you and wants you to succeed in life, wants to see you excel in life. He watches over you. And so we pray, our father. You know, this isn't a guy when you say our father, he doesn't say, what do you want now? How much do you want? What have you done? He loves you. He says that you're special. But here's the thing. You are not so special. Everybody else is special too. Everyone that you come in contact with is a human being that is loved by the Father. We say our Father in heaven. How far away do you think heaven is? I mean, I kind of grew up thinking that heaven was over the clouds. Like if I got to ever ride in an airplane, I'd get to be able to see God up there in heaven. In the ancient world, they actually split up the heavens. In fact, in the, in the scripture, it's plural for a reason. They would actually think of different levels of heavens. So you had the heavens that were up in the, the planets and the stars. You had the heavens that were the, the sky where you see the, the beautiful clouds and the birds are flying through. And then there's also the air that's right around your bodies. When you think of God in heaven, you could probably pray this, Our God who is closer than the air I breathe. Our God who is closer than the air that's about to go inside our lungs. That's how close God is in heaven to us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. What does that mean? That means, God, I just pray that your glory is magnified here on earth. I pray that you would be adored, Lord, that you would be worshipped, Lord, that you would be honored. I am in awe and I am in wonder of who you are. Hallowed be your name. May you be praised. A lot of people have a messed up idea that, you know, they think, why does our God feel like he has to be praised by us all the time. Is he he some kind of like narcissistic individual that needs to be, you know, stroked by his people all the time? That is a totally opposite way of thinking about praise and worship. Worship isn't something we do to boost God's self-esteem. C.S. Lewis wrote about this. When we see something we love, we naturally desire to praise it. Think about that. You know, in fact, the act of praising doesn't just express our joy, it becomes part of our joy. That's what that means. Imagine the frustration you feel if you saw your child just kick the winning goal in this amazing championship soccer game, but you weren't allowed to cheer. That would be so hard. It would be impossible for a parent to be able to do that when we see something worthy of praise part of our joy is to be able to share in that joy and adoration and worship all enjoyment overflows into praise valentine's day is coming up just a little hint guys valentine's day is coming up real soon so we praise our beloved one you know today's the big game nobody cares but today, you know, we'll have, we'll have sports fans, you know, that want to praise their sports team. Anything for that matter. We can praise the beauty of the sunset. We can praise beautiful flowers. We can praise beautifully made food. We can praise books. We can even praise little beautiful golden retriever puppies. Praise is inner health made audible. That's C.S. Lewis. Praise is inner health made audible. The Bible says in Psalm 145.3, Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. 
And my friend, when God is fully cherished by his people, our hearts can't do anything else but be right at home praising God because we are so amazed by how great he is. Hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. And then your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let me ask a question at this point. How many of you, if you have ever prayed, has ever had your mind kind of wander away? Come on, you can raise, I know, maybe just me. Here's the thing, I don't know about you, but sometimes I wonder why prayer is so hard. I mean, I don't know about you, but sometimes my mind and my thought process can get so random. You know, I'll be praying to God and then all of a sudden I start thinking random thoughts. When my thoughts start to get really random, it starts to go down a rabbit hole that I don't want to go. Whenever we have these random thoughts, it always ends up in some kind of way of fear, which ends up in worry in some area of our life. Every time I start praying, the next thing I know, I find myself worrying maybe about my kids. Maybe I'm worrying about my mom. Maybe I'm worrying about one of my other problems. For me... The part of the Lord's Prayer is, is right here, this kind of reorienting my mind, reorienting myself. You go into a mall or, you know, if I, I was going into the Phoenix airport, I hadn't been there for well, years and years. I was totally lost. And I needed to go to one of those kiosks that showed me and said, you are here. That's what kind of we need to do when we're praying. We have to reorient where we are so that we can say, you know what, God I am here. I remember your kingdom is where I am. I'm not located in my problems. I'm not located in my anxiety. I'm not located in my, in my worry. I'm not located in my sin or my guilt. I'm located in your kingdom where your kingdom comes. My will doesn't happen. Your will be done. Your will will reign over anything else and take care of me no matter what because it's God will that I will be alive. And I can, I can be who I am because I am living in God's kingdom, in God's will. And I can say to God, God, you know what? I want to so much. I want to be a part of this great movement that you have started where you are bringing heaven from up there down here. I want to tell Jesus. I want to tell of Jesus and everything that he has done for my life and my testimony to the people who don't know who he is. That's what I want to do with my life. And God, I want to pray this to you. God, your will be done in me. Your will be done in my body. Your will be done in my heart. Your will be done in my time. Your will be done with my money. Your will be done in my energy. Your will be done in every relationship that I have on this planet with this day. And that leads to the next request. Give us today our daily bread. I love this part of the prayer. For this part of the prayer, I'll often say, God, just look at my schedule. See what I have planned for the day. Open up my calendar, God. I actually have a calendar on my computer that lets me know what I'm going to be doing that day. God, help me when I meet with this person or I have a phone conversation with this person or, or whatever it is that I'm doing in my day. I'll ask God, would you help me with this? Give me today what I need for today. Give me today what I need for today. And guys, this is so important. Daily bread, provision for my life, answers to problems, answers to things that I just don't have answers for, strength that comes one day at a time. It's not about, God, give me what I need for the rest of my life. It's, God, give me what I need today. Give me what I need today. Give us today. You know, Imagine that your, your kid, if you, had, if you had a child who was just, you know, eating his breakfast in the morning and you went downstairs and he has his Fruit Loops and he's eating his Fruit Loops and then all of a sudden you see him, he, he takes half the Fruit Loops and he puts it in a little, you know, little bag and closes it up and you're like, what, what are you doing? Well, I'm just saving this part of my Fruit Loops because I don't know if you're going to feed me tomorrow. And you're like, hey... You don't have to worry about tomorrow. 
You worry about today. My job is to worry about tomorrow. I'm going to take care of you. That's the same thing. When I worry, I always worry about the future. I always worry about tomorrow. But I find I can face anything if I can just face with God one day at a time. One day at a time. Good song. God, just give me wisdom for today. Just give me strength for today. Give me the love that I need for that, that, that hard person to love for today. Give me patience that I need for today. Give me hope. Give me peace, God, that I want so much in my life, but give it for me for this day. Give us today our daily bread. And then forgive us our debts. Forgive us our debts. People sometimes wonder, how often do I need to confess my sin? Well, I would ask, how often do you sin? That's about how often. There's a story of a woman who had a three-year-old granddaughter, and they were outside, and, and the little girl was playing in the mud, and she just learned that, man, playing with mud is really fun. And Grandma, who the little girl called Nana, would be reading her book, but she kind of made a mistake. She was kind of facing her, her chair the other way, just kind of having a little bit of quiet time, alone time, listening to her daughter playing. She turned around and saw this incredibly muddy mess that her granddaughter had made, and it was terrible. So she, like, cleans her up, cleans up all the mess, and she says, hey, don't make any more mud. You can play out here, but stop playing in the mud. But the little girl really liked mud. The, really, the girl really wanted to play in mud. And she saw that Grandma had kind of wised up and had turned her chair toward her, and now she could read her book while watching her play. She didn't like that too much. So as gently as she could and as nicely as she could, she said, Don't look at me, Nana. Okay? <laughs> See, this is the real sinner's prayer. Don't look at me, God. Okay? Don't look at me, God. You know what? I, I want to indulge in my temper. Don't look at me, God. Okay? I, I want to ignore this poor person that's right here on this corner. Don't look at me, God. I, I want to indulge in, in some kind of appetite that I have. You know, I want to give less than my best at school. I want to give less than my best at work. Don't look at me, God. Don't look at me, God, okay? I want to deceive this person. Don't look at me, God, okay? I want to promote myself. I want to puff myself up. I want people to think that I'm somebody that I'm not. In fact, let me take a Snapchat. Don't look at me, God, though, okay? Here's the thing about doing wrong. Doing wrong requires that we stop thinking about God. We have to cut God out of our thought process when we do something like that. Remember we talked about how crucial our thinking, how crucial our mind is. We do that so often, we don't even know we're doing it anymore. We don't even notice. It becomes this habit. And we just don't even see it. And then we wonder why God seems so far. Forgive us our debts. For me, I'll often do this, you know, when I'm starting to wind down at night. And I'll just think, you know, I'll say, God, I'm kind of kind of scene by scene go through my day. Yeah, I talked to Kevin a little bit harshly there. How 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 can I how can I make that right? Yeah, how can I clean this up? You know, how can I how can I was there an unkind thing that I, that I did to somebody or was there some way that I can make amends to somebody for doing something that I shouldn't have? Was I dishonest? Was I selfish somewhere? Where, where do I need help? And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Now, we're going to look at this a little bit more next week. We're going to have a whole Sunday to talk about this great topic of, of forgiveness and you won't want to miss that. But for today... I just, I just want to say it's mentally impossible for us to really receive God's amazing tender heart toward us at the same time restraining our hard heart 
with somebody else. Those two are so closely held together, it's actually, it's impossible for us to do it. Not that it, it, it should be impossible, it's literally impossible for us to do that. I can't embrace God's forgiveness for me and my unforgiveness towards somebody else in my life. It's impossible. That receiving and that offering is something that is very closely related. It's something that's, that's very close. It's not just something that we can just kind of fake. The next phrase, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. This is where we ask for guidance. This is we ask, God, would you help me and guide me through this area of my life? Keep me from falling into being the worst part of myself. I find that when Jennifer goes off to go off to California, I end up being a really lazy bum. God, help me to not be that lazy guy. Maybe I could feed the dog once in a while. Help me to not be that, that, that person that falls into destructive habits. That person that, that falls into patterns that I know are not in your will. That's what it's talking about. You know, I saw another prayer not long ago that's really useful to me because it expresses the amount of help that I actually need when it comes to praying to God and this temptation. And it goes like this. Dear God, so far I've done all right. I haven't gossiped. I haven't lost my temper. Haven't even been greedy, grumpy, nasty, selfish, or overindulgent. Not once. I'm really glad about that. But in a few minutes, God, I'm about to get up out of bed. And from then on, I'm going to really need a lot more help. See, somebody who's going to lead me, well, if it's not God, it's going to be somebody else. The good news of that is we get to choose who that person can be. But who is it going to be if it's not God? You know, how often in the moments of my day do I not pray, God, Forgive me of, of my, my temptation that I have to not trust in you to take care of me. How often in my day do I not pray, God, deliver me from my anger issue. God, deliver me from my fear. God, deliver me from this foolishness that I find myself in over and over and over again. God, would you guide me? God, would you direct me? God, would you show me where to go? God, would you lead me? God, lead me not into temptation. Deliver me from evil. If you look at your Bible in Matthew 6, 13, you'll notice that this prayer, as Jesus prayed the Lord's Prayer, actually ends right there. It just ends right there. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Jesus had a tendency to do this with his with his examples to us and with his stories. He often ends his material in kind of a, well, kind of a hard way. We'll see this in the Sermon on the Mount. When we get to the very end of the Sermon on the Mount, and he's talking about how the foolish man built his house on sand, he says, and great was its fall. Boom, the end. Or in his story with the prodigal son, who goes back home and he, you know, and the father is so excited to see that his son come back home and he has this great big feast for his son and the older son gets all dejected and angry and he goes outside and the story ends, brother, come inside. Boom, the end. And we wonder why. See, Jesus doesn't just flower up his stories because he understands how important an unresolved ending is. He's in the business of changing souls and changing lives. And that's going to stick in our brains a lot more. Very early on in this great prayer, Jesus' followers added these words, and they're part of the prayer as well. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. In other words, God, your will be done. You are in control. You are large and in charge. And then that very last word, amen. Amen. Let me speak a word on this little word, amen. I don't know about you, but I have noticed that sometimes when I go through my, my prayer time, sometimes by myself, my mind 
will actually wander. And then I'll find myself, I'm not even even praying anymore. And I can't even imagine doing that to, to, to you people. You know, I go up to Billy. Billy, thank you so much for preaching last Sunday. Anyway, what am I going to be doing tomorrow? Uh, I can't even believe what, I am hungry. Oh, I have three things to do. And Billy's just left standing there going, what just happened? And yet we do that to God. Our minds just wander and we just kind of move on with our day. Oh, he'll always be there. I'll get back to you later. You know how important it is when we talked about earlier, when we start to pray to God, it's really important to address who we're praying to. Our Father, hallowed be your name. It's just as important to be able to end our prayer well. And we end this prayer with, Amen. Amen is like the word yes on steroids. It's like, let it be. This is what I want. Amen. It's a resounding affirmation of the Spirit. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. That's it. Let it be. Amen. So that's the greatest prayer ever prayed. And our homework together is to be able to read this prayer one time every day for a week. And before we end this morning, I want us to say this prayer out loud together. In fact, would you stand with me as we read the words of Jesus, and we're going to say this out loud together. Ready? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Remember that the God that we worship and praise is as close to us as the air that we're about to bring into our lungs. Would you pray with me?